The Wind in the Rose Bush by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. Recording by Ann Simmons. Ford Village has no railroad station, being on the other side of the river from Porter's Falls, and accessible only by the Ford which gives it its name, and a ferry line. The ferry boat was waiting when Rebecca Flint got off the train with her bag and lunch basket. When she and her small trunk were safely embarked, she sat stiff and straight and calm in the ferry boat as it shot swiftly and smoothly across stream. There was a horse attached to a light country wagon on board, and he pawed the deck uneasily. His owner stood near, with a wary eye upon him, although he was chewing with as dully reflective an expression as a cow. Beside Rebecca sat a woman of about her own age, who kept looking at her with furtive curiosity. Her husband, short and stout and saturnine, stood near her. Rebecca paid no attention to either of them. She was tall and spare and pale, the type of a spinster, yet with rudimentary lines and expressions of matronhood. She all unconsciously held her shawl, rolled up in a canvas bag on her left hip, as if it had been a child. She wore a settled frown of dissent at life, but it was the frown of a mother who regarded life as a froward child rather than as an overwhelming fate. The other woman continued staring at her. She was mildly stupid, except for an overdeveloped curiosity which made her at times sharp beyond belief. Her eyes glittered. Red spots came on her flaccid cheeks. She kept opening her mouth to speak, making little abortive motions. Finally, she could endure it no longer. She nudged Rebecca boldly. A pleasant day, said she. Rebecca looked at her and nodded coldly. Yes, very, she assented. Have you come far? I've come from Michigan. Oh, said the woman with awe. It's a long way she remarked presently. Yes, it is, replied Rebecca conclusively. Still, the other woman was not daunted. There was something which she determined to know, possibly roused thereto by a vague sense of incongruity in the other's appearance. It's a long ways to come and leave a family, she remarked with painful slyness. I ain't got any family to leave, returned Rebecca shortly. Then you ain't? No, I ain't. Oh, said the woman. Rebecca looked straight ahead at the race of the river. It was a long ferry. Finally, Rebecca herself waxed unexpectedly loquacious. She turned to the other woman and inquired if she knew John Dent's widow, who lived in Ford Village. Her husband died about three years ago, she said by way of detail. The woman started violently. She turned pale, then she flushed. She cast a strange glance at her husband, who was regarding both women with a sort of stolid keenness. Yes, I guess I do, faltered the woman finally. Well, his first wife was my sister, said Rebecca, with the air of one imparting important intelligence. Was she? responded the other woman feebly. She glanced at her husband with an expression of doubt and terror, and he shook his head forbiddingly. I'm going to see her and take my niece Agnes home with me, said Rebecca. Then the woman gave such a violent start that she noticed it. What is the matter? she asked. Nothing, I guess, replied the woman with eyes on her husband, who was slowly shaking his head like a Chinese toy. Is my niece sick? asked Rebecca with quick suspicion. No, she ain't sick, replied the woman with alacrity. Then she caught her breath with a gasp. When did you see her? Let me see. I ain't seen her for some little time, replied the woman. Then she caught her breath again. She ought to have grown up real pretty if she takes after my sister. She was a real pretty woman. Rebecca said wistfully. Yes, I guess she did grow up pretty, replied the woman in a trembling voice. What kind of a woman is the second wife? 
the woman glanced at her husband's warning face. She continued to gaze at him while she replied in a choking voice to Rebecca. I guess she's a nice woman, she replied. I don't know. I guess so. I don't see much of her. I felt kind of hurt that John married again so quick, said Rebecca. But I suppose he wanted his house kept, and Agnes wanted care. I wasn't so situated that I could take her when her mother died. I had my own mother to care for, and I was school teaching. Now mother has gone, and my uncle died six months ago and left me quite a little property. And I've given up my school, and I've come for Agnes. I guess she'll be glad to go with me, though I suppose her stepmother is a good woman and has always done for her. The man's warning shake at his wife was fairly portentous. I guess so, said she. John always wrote that she was a beautiful woman, said Rebecca. Then the ferry boat grated on the shore. John Dent's widow had sent a horse and wagon to meet her sister-in-law. When the woman and her husband went down the road, on which Rebecca in the wagon with her trunk soon passed them, she said reproachfully, Seems as if I'd ought to have told her, Thomas. Let her find it out herself, replied the man. Don't you go to burning your fingers and other folks' pudding, Maria. Do you suppose she'll see anything? asked the woman with a spasmodic shudder and a terrified roll of her eyes. See, returned her husband with stolid scorn. Better be sure there's anything to see. Oh, Thomas, they say. Lord, ain't you found out that what they say is mostly lies? But if it should be true, and she's a nervous woman, she might be scared enough to lose her wits, said his wife, staring uneasily after Rebecca's erect figure in the wagon, disappearing over the crest of the hilly road. Wits that so easy upset ain't worth much declared the man. You keep out of it, Maria. Rebecca, in the meantime, rode on in the wagon beside a flaxen-headed boy who looked, to her understanding, not very bright. She asked him a question, and he paid no attention. She repeated it, and he responded with a bewildered and incoherent grunt. Then she let him alone, after making sure that he knew how to drive straight. They had traveled about half a mile, past the village square, and gone a short distance beyond, when the boy drew up with a sudden, whoa, before a very prosperous-looking house. It had been one of the aboriginal cottages of the vicinity, small and white, with a roof extending on one side over a piazza, and a tiny L jutting out in the rear, on the right hand. Now the cottage was transformed by dormer windows, a bay window on the piazza-less side, a carved railing down the front steps, and a modern hardwood door. "'Is this John Dent's house?' asked Rebecca. The boy was as sparing of speech as a philosopher. His only response was in flinging the reins over the horse's back, stretching out one foot to the shaft, and leaping out of the wagon, then going around to the rear for the trunk. Rebecca got out and went toward the house, Its white paint had a new gloss. Its blinds were an immaculate apple green. The lawn was trimmed as smooth as velvet, and it was dotted with scrupulous groups of hydrangeas and cannas. I always understood that John Dent was well-to-do, Rebecca reflected comfortably. I guess Agnes will have considerable. I've got enough, but it will come in handy for her schooling. She can have advantages." The boy dragged the trunk up the fine gravel walk, but before he reached the steps leading up to the piazza, for the house stood on a terrace, the front door opened, and a fair, frizzled head of a very large and handsome woman appeared. She held up her black silk skirt, disclosing voluminous ruffles of starched embroidery, and waited for Rebecca. She smiled placidly. Her pink, double-chinned face widened and dimpled, but her blue eyes were wary and calculating. She extended her hand as Rebecca climbed the steps. This is Miss Flint, I suppose, said she. Yes, ma'am, replied Rebecca, noticing with bewilderment 
a curious expression compounded of fear and defiance on the other's face. Your letter only arrived this morning, said Mrs. Dent in a steady voice. Her great face was a uniform pink, and her china blue eyes were at once aggressive and veiled with secrecy. Yes, I hardly thought you'd get my letter, replied Rebecca. I felt as if I could not wait to hear from you before I came. I supposed you would be so situated that you could have me a little while without putting you out too much from what John used to write me about his circumstances, and when I had that money so unexpected, I felt as if I must come for Agnes. I suppose you'll be willing to give her up. You know she's my own blood, and of course she's no relation to you, though you must have got attached to her. I know from her picture what a sweet girl she must be. And John always said she looked like her own mother, and Grace was a beautiful woman, if she was my sister. Rebecca stopped and stared at the other woman in amazement and alarm. The great handsome blonde creature stood speechless, livid, gasping, with her hand to her heart, her lips parted in a horrible caricature of a smile. Are you sick? cried Rebecca, drawing near. Don't you want me to get you some water? Then Mrs. Dent recovered herself with a great effort. It is nothing, she said. I am subject to spells. I am over it now. Won't you come in, Miss Flint? As she spoke, the beautiful deep rose color suffused her face. Her blue eyes met her visitors with the opaqueness of turquoise, with a revelation of blue, but a concealment of all behind. Rebecca followed her hostess in, and the boy, who had waited quiescently, climbed the steps with the trunk. But before they entered the door, a strange thing happened. On the upper terrace, close to the piazza post, grew a great rose bush, and on it, late in the season though it was, one small red perfect rose. Rebecca looked at it, and the other woman extended her hand with a quick gesture. Don't you pick that rose, she brusquely cried. Rebecca drew herself up with stiff dignity. I ain't in the habit of picking other folks' roses without leave said she. As Rebecca spoke, she started violently and lost sight of her resentment, for something singular happened. Suddenly, the rose bush was agitated violently, as if by a gust of wind, yet it was a remarkably still day. Not a leaf of the hydrangea standing on the terrace close to the rose trembled. What on earth? began Rebecca. Then she stopped with a gasp at the sight of the other woman's face. Although a face, it gave somehow the impression of a desperately clutched hand of secrecy. Come in, said she in a harsh voice, which seemed to come forth from her chest with no intervention of the organs of speech. Come into the house. I'm getting cold out here. What makes that rose bush blow so when there isn't any wind? asked Rebecca, trembling with vague horror yet resolute. I don't see as it is blowing, returned the woman calmly, and as she spoke, indeed the bush was quiet. It was blowing, declared Rebecca. It isn't now, said Mrs. Dent. I can't try to account for everything that blows out of doors. I have too much to do, she spoke scornfully and confidently, with defiant, unflinching eyes, first on the bush, then on Rebecca and led the way into the house. It looked queer, persisted Rebecca, but she followed, and also the boy with the trunk. Rebecca entered an interior, prosperous, even elegant, according to her simple ideas. There were Brussels carpets, lace curtains, and plenty of brilliant upholstery and polished wood. You're real nicely situated, remarked Rebecca, after she had become a little accustomed to her new surroundings and the two women were seated at the tea table. Mrs. Dent stared with a hard complacency from behind her silver-plated service. Yes, I be, said she. You got all the things new, said Rebecca hesitatingly, with a jealous memory of her dead sister's bridal furnishings. Yes, said Mrs. Dent. I was never one to want dead folks' things, and I had money enough of my own. So I wasn't beholden to John 
I had the old duds put up at auction. They didn't bring much. I suppose you saved some for Agnes. She'll want some of her poor mother's things when she is grown up, said Rebecca with some indignation. The defiant stare of Mrs. Dent's blue eyes waxed more intense. There's a few things up, Garrett, said she. She'll be likely to value them, remarked Rebecca. As she spoke, she glanced at the window. Isn't it most time for her to be coming home? she asked. Most time, answered Mrs. Dent carelessly. But when she gets over to Addie Slocum's, she never knows when to come home. Is Addie Slocum her intimate friend? Intimate as any. Maybe we can have her come out to see Agnes when she's living with me, said Rebecca wistfully. I suppose she'll be likely to be homesick at first. Most likely, answered Mrs. Dent. Does she call you mother? Rebecca asked. No, she calls me Aunt Emmeline, replied the other woman shortly. When did you say you were going home? In about a week, I thought, if she can be ready to go so soon, answered Rebecca with a surprised look. She reflected that she would not remain a day longer than she could help after such an inhospitable look and question. Oh, as far as that goes, said Mrs. Dent, it wouldn't make any difference about her being ready. You could go home whenever you felt that you must, and she could come afterward. Alone? Why not? She's a big girl now, and you don't have to change cars. My niece will go home when I do, and not travel alone, and if I can't wait here for her, in the house that used to be her mother's and my sister's home, I'll go and board somewhere, returned Rebecca with warmth. Oh, you can stay here as long as you want to. You're welcome, said Mrs. Dent. Then Rebecca started. There she is she declared in a trembling, exultant voice. Nobody knew how she longed to see the girl. She isn't as late as I thought she'd be, said Mrs. Dent. And again that curious, subtle change passed over her face, and again it settled into that stony impassiveness. Rebecca stared at the door, waiting for it to open. Where is she? she asked presently. I guess she stopped to take off her hat in the entry, suggested Mrs. Dent. Rebecca waited. Why don't she come? It can't take her all this time to take off her hat. For answer, Mrs. Dent rose with a stiff jerk and threw open the door. Agnes, she called. Agnes. Then she turned and eyed Rebecca. She ain't there. I saw her pass the window, said Rebecca in bewilderment. You must have been mistaken. I know I did persisted Rebecca. You couldn't have. I did. I saw first a shadow go over the ceiling, then I saw her in the glass there. She pointed to a mirror over the sideboard opposite. And then the shadow passed the window. How did she look in the glass? Little and light-haired, with the light hair kind of tossing over her forehead. You couldn't have seen her. Was that like Agnes? Like enough. But of course you didn't see her. You've been thinking so much about her that you thought you did. You thought you did? I thought I saw a shadow pass the window, but I must have been mistaken. She didn't come in, or we would have seen her before now. I knew it was too early for her to get home from Addie Slocum's anyhow. When Rebecca went to bed, Agnes had not returned. Rebecca had resolved that she would not retire until the girl came. But she was very tired, and she reasoned with herself that she was foolish. Besides, Mrs. Dent suggested that Agnes might go to the church social with Addie Slocum. When Rebecca suggested that she be sent for and told that her aunt had come, Mrs. Dent laughed meaningly. I guess you'll find out that a young girl ain't so ready to leave a sociable where there's boys to see her aunt, said she. She's too young, said Rebecca incredulously and indignantly. She's sixteen, replied Mrs. Dent, and she's always been great for the boys. She's going to school four years after I get her before she thinks of boys, declared Rebecca. We'll see, laughed the other woman. After Rebecca went to bed, 
She lay awake a long time listening for the sound of girlish laughter and a boy's voice under her window. Then she fell asleep. The next morning she was down early. Mrs. Dent, who kept no servants, was busily preparing breakfast. Don't Agnes help you about breakfast? asked Rebecca. No, I let her lay, replied Mrs. Dent shortly. What time did she get home last night? She didn't get home. What? She didn't get home. She stayed with Addie. She often does. Without sending you word? Oh, she knew I wouldn't worry. When will she be home? Oh, I guess she'll be along pretty soon. Rebecca was uneasy, but she tried to conceal it, for she knew of no good reason for uneasiness. What was there to occasion alarm in the fact of one young girl staying overnight with another? She could not eat much breakfast. Afterward, she went out on the little piazza, although her hostess strove furtively to stop her. Why don't you go out back of the house? It's real pretty, a view over the river, she said. I guess I'll go out here, replied Rebecca. She had a purpose to watch for the absent girl. Presently, Rebecca came hustling into the house through the sitting room, into the kitchen where Mrs. Dent was cooking. That rose bush, she gasped. Mrs. Dent turned and faced her. What of it? It's a blowin'. What of it? There isn't a mite of wind this morning. Mrs. Dent turned with an inimitable toss of her fair head. If you think I can spend my time puzzling over such nonsense as she began, but Rebecca interrupted her with a cry and a rush to the door. There she is now, she cried. She flung the door wide open, and curiously enough, a breeze came in, and her own gray hair tossed, and a paper blew off the table to the floor with a loud rustle. But there was nobody in sight. There's nobody here, Rebecca said. She looked blankly at the other woman, who brought a rolling pin down on a slab of pie crust with a thud. I didn't hear anybody, she said calmly. I saw somebody pass that window. You were mistaken again. I know I saw somebody. You couldn't have. Please shut that door. Rebecca shut the door. She sat down beside the window and looked out on the autumnal yard with its little curve of footpath to the kitchen door. What smells so strong of roses in this room? She said presently. She sniffed hard. I don't smell anything but these nutmegs. It is not nutmeg. I don't smell anything else. Where do you suppose Agnes is? Oh, perhaps she has gone over the ferry to Porter's Falls with Addie. She often does. Addie's got an aunt over there, and Addie's got a cousin, a real pretty boy. You suppose she's gone over there? Maybe. I shouldn't wonder. When should she be home? Oh, not before afternoon. Rebecca waited with all the patience she could muster. She kept reassuring herself, telling herself that it was all natural, that the other woman could not help it, but she made up her mind that if Agnes did not return that afternoon, she should be sent for. When it was four o'clock, she started up with resolution. She had been furtively watching the onyx clock on the sitting room mantel. She had timed herself. She had said that if Agnes was not home by that time, she should demand that she be sent for. She rose and stood before Mrs. Dent, who looked up coolly from her embroidery. I've waited just about as long as I'm going to, she said. I've come away from Michigan to see my own sister's daughter and take her home with me. I've been here ever since yesterday, 24 hours, and I haven't seen her. Now I'm going to. I want her sent for. Mrs. Dent folded her embroidery and rose. Well, I don't blame you, she said. It is high time she came home. I'll go right over and get her myself. Rebecca heaved a sigh of relief. She hardly knew what she had suspected or feared, but she knew that her position had been one of antagonism, if not accusation, and she was sensible of relief. I wish you would, 
she said gratefully, and went back to her chair while Mrs. Dent got her shawl and her little white head tie. I wouldn't trouble you, but I do feel as if I couldn't wait any longer to see her, she remarked apologetically. Oh, it ain't any trouble at all, said Mrs. Dent as she went out. I don't blame you. You have waited long enough. Rebecca sat at the window watching breathlessly until Mrs. Dent came stepping through the yard alone. She ran to the door and saw, hardly noticing it this time, that the rose bush was again violently agitated, yet with no wind evident elsewhere. Where is she? she cried. Mrs. Dent laughed with stiff lips as she came up the steps over the terrace. Girls will be girls, said she. She's gone with Addie to Lincoln. Addie's got an uncle who's conductor on the train and lives there, and he got him passes, and they're going to stay to Addie's Aunt Margaret's a few days. Mrs. Slocum said Addie didn't have time to come over and ask me before the train went, but she took it on herself to say it would be all right and... Why hadn't she been over to tell you? Rebecca was angry, though not suspicious. She even saw no reason for her anger. Oh, she was putting up grapes. She was coming over just as soon as she got the black off her hands. She heard I had company, and her hands were a sight. She was holding them over sulfur matches. You say she's going to stay a few days? repeated Rebecca dazedly. Yes, till Thursday, Mrs. Slocum said. How far is Lincoln from here? About fifty miles. It'll be a real treat to her. Mrs. Slocum's sister is a real nice woman. It is going to make it pretty late about my going home. If you don't feel as if you could wait, I'll get her ready and send her on just as soon as I can, Mrs. Dent said sweetly. I'm going to wait said Rebecca grimly. The two women sat down again, and Mrs. Dent took up her embroidery. Is there any sewing I can do for her? Rebecca asked finally in a desperate way. If I can get her sewing along some. Mrs. Dent arose with alacrity and fetched a mass of white from the closet. Here, she said. If you want to sew the lace on this nightgown, I was going to put her to it, but she'll be glad enough to get rid of it. She ought to have this and one more before she goes. I don't like to send her away without some good underclothing. Rebecca snatched at the little white garment and sewed feverishly. That night, she wakened from a deep sleep a little after midnight and lay a minute trying to collect her faculties and explain to herself what she was listening to. At last, she discovered that it was the then-popular strains of The Maiden's Prayer, floating up through the floor from the piano in the sitting room below. She jumped up, threw a shawl over her nightgown, and hurried downstairs, trembling. There was nobody in the sitting room. The piano was silent. She ran to Mrs. Dent's bedroom and called hysterically, Emmeline! Emmeline! What is it? asked Mrs. Dent's voice from the bed. The voice was stern, but had a note of consciousness in it. Who, who was that playing the maiden's prayer in the sitting room on the piano? I didn't hear anybody. There was someone. I didn't hear anything. I tell you there was someone, but there ain't anybody there. I didn't hear anything. I did. Somebody was playing the maiden's prayer on the piano. Has Agnes got home? I want to know. Of course Agnes hasn't got home, answered Mrs. Dent with rising inflection. Be you gone crazy over that girl? The last boat from Porter's Falls was in before we went to bed. Of course she ain't come. I heard you were dreaming. I wasn't. I was broad awake. Rebecca went back to her chamber and kept her lamp burning all night. The next morning, her eyes upon Mrs. Dent were wary and blazing with suppressed excitement. She kept opening her mouth as if to speak, then frowning and setting her lips hard. After breakfast, she went upstairs and came down presently with her coat and bonnet. 
Now, Emmeline, she said, I want to know where the Slocums live. Mrs. Dent gave a strange, long, half-lidded glance at her. She was finishing her coffee. Why? she asked. I'm going over there and find out if they have heard anything from her daughter and Agnes since they went away. I don't like what I heard last night. You must have been dreaming. It don't make any odds whether I was or not. Does she play the maiden's prayer on the piano? I want to know. What if she does? She plays it a little, I believe. I don't know. She don't half play it anyhow. She ain't got an ear. That wasn't half played last night. I don't like such things happening. I ain't superstitious, but I don't like it. I'm going. Where do the Slocums live? You go down the road over the bridge past the old grist mill. Then you turn to the left. It's the only house for half a mile. You can't miss it. It has a barn with a ship in full sail on the cupola. Well, I'm going. I don't feel easy. About two hours later, Rebecca returned. There were red spots on her cheeks. She looked wild. I've been there, she said, and there isn't a soul at home. Something has happened. What has happened? I don't know. Something. I had a warning last night. There wasn't a soul there. They've been sent for to Lincoln. Did you see anybody to ask? asked Mrs. Dent with thinly concealed anxiety. I asked the woman that lives on the turn of the road. She's stone deaf, I suppose you know. She listened while I screamed at her to know where the Slocums were, and then she said, Mrs. Smith don't live here. I didn't see anybody on the road, and that's the only house. What do you suppose it means? I don't suppose it means much of anything, replied Mrs. Dent coolly. Mr. Slocum is conductor on the railroad, and he'd be away anyway, and Mrs. Slocum often goes early when he does, to spend the day with her sister in Porter's Falls. She'd be more likely to go away than Addie. And you don't think anything has happened? Rebecca asked, with diminishing distrust before the reasonableness of it. Land, no. Rebecca went upstairs to lay aside her coat and bonnet but she came hurrying back with them still on. "'Who's been in my room?' she gasped. Her face was pale as ashes. Mrs. Dent also paled as she regarded her. "'What do you mean?' she asked slowly. "'I found when I went upstairs that little nightgown of Agnes's on the bed, laid out. It was laid out.' The sleeves were folded across the bosom, and there was that little red rose between them. Emmeline, what is it? Emmeline, what's the matter? Oh! Mrs. Dent was struggling for breath in great, choking gasps. She clung to the back of a chair. Rebecca, trembling herself so she could scarcely keep on her feet, got her some water. As soon as she recovered herself... Mrs. Dent regarded her with eyes full of the strangest mixture of fear and horror and hostility. "'What do you mean talking so?' she said in a hard voice. "'It is there!' "'Nonsense. You threw it down and it fell that way. "'It was folded in my bureau drawer. It couldn't have been. "'Who picked that red rose?' "'Look on the bush,' Mrs. Dent replied shortly." Rebecca looked at her. Her mouth gaped. She hurried out of the room. When she came back, her eyes seemed to protrude. She had, in the meantime, hastened upstairs and come down with tottering steps, clinging to the banisters. Now I want to know what all this means, she demanded. What what means? The rose is on the bush, and it's gone from the bed in my room. Is this house haunted or what? I don't know anything about a house being haunted. I don't believe in such things. Be you crazy? Mrs. Dent spoke with gathering force. The color flashed back to her cheeks. No, said Rebecca shortly. I ain't crazy yet, but I shall be if this keeps on much longer. I'm going to find out where that girl is before night. Mrs. Dent eyed her. What be you going to do? I'm going to Lincoln.
A faint, triumphant smile overspread Mrs. Dent's large face. You can't, said she. There ain't any train. No train? No, there ain't any afternoon train from the falls to Lincoln. Then I'm going over to the Slocums again tonight. However, Rebecca did not go. Such a rain came up as deterred even her resolution, and she had only her best dresses with her. Then in the evening came the letter from the Michigan village which she had left nearly a week ago. It was from her cousin, a single woman who had come to keep her house while she was away. It was a pleasant, unexciting letter enough, all the first of it, and related mostly how she missed Rebecca, how she hoped she was having pleasant weather and kept her health, and how her friend, Mrs. Greenaway, had come to stay with her since she had felt lonesome the first night in the house how she hoped Rebecca would have no objections to this, although nothing had been said about it, since she had not realized that she might be nervous alone. The cousin was painfully conscientious, hence the letter. Rebecca smiled in spite of her disturbed mind as she read it. Then her eye caught the postscript. That was in a different hand, purporting to be written by the friend Mrs. Hannah Greenaway, informing her that the cousin had fallen down the cellar stairs and broken her hip, and was in a dangerous condition, and begging Rebecca to return at once, as she herself was rheumatic, and unable to nurse her properly, and no one else could be obtained. Rebecca looked at Mrs. Dent, who had come to her room with the letter quite late. It was half-past nine, and she had gone upstairs for the night. Where did this come from? she asked. Mr. Amblecrome brought it, she replied. Who's he? The postmaster. He often brings the letters that come on the late mail. He knows I ain't anybody to send. He brought yours about your coming. He said he and his wife came over on the ferry boat with you. I remember him, Rebecca replied shortly. There's bad news in this letter. Mrs. Dent's face took on an expression of serious inquiry. Yes, my cousin Harriet has fallen down the cellar stairs. They were always dangerous, and she's broken her hip, and I've got to take the first train home tomorrow. You don't say so. I'm dreadfully sorry. No, you ain't sorry, said Rebecca, with a look as if she leaped. You're glad. I don't know why, but you're glad. You've wanted to get rid of me for some reason ever since I came. I don't know why. You're a strange woman. Now you've got your way, and I hope you're satisfied. How you talk. Mrs. Dent spoke in a faintly injured voice, but there was a light in her eyes. I talk the way it is. Well, I'm going home tomorrow morning, and I want you, just as soon as Agnes Dent comes home, to send her out to me. Don't you wait for anything. You pack what clothes she's got, and don't wait even to mend them, and you buy her ticket. I'll leave the money, and you send her along. She don't have to change cars. You start her off when she gets home on the next train. Very well, replied the other woman. She had an expression of covert amusement. Mind you do it. Very well, Rebecca. Rebecca started on her journey the next morning. When she arrived two days later, she found her cousin in perfect health. She found, moreover, that the friend had not written the postscript in the cousin's letter. Rebecca would have returned to Ford Village the next morning, but the fatigue and nervous strain had been too much for her. She was not able to move from her bed. She had a species of low fever induced by anxiety and fatigue. But she could write, and she did, to the Slocums. And she received no answer. She also wrote to Mrs. Dent. She even sent numerous telegrams, with no response. Finally, she wrote to the postmaster, and an answer arrived by the first possible mail. The letter was short, curt, and to the purpose. Mr. Amblecrom, the postmaster, was a man of few words, and especially wary as to his expressions in a letter. Dear Madam, he wrote, your favor received. No slocums in Ford's village. All dead. Addie ten years ago. Her mother, two years later, 
her father five. House vacant. Mrs. John Dent said to have neglected stepdaughter. Girl was sick. Medicine not given. Talk of taking action. Not enough evidence. House said to be haunted. Strange sights and sounds. Your niece, Agnes Dent, died a year ago, about this time. Yours truly, Thomas Amblecrom. End of The Wind in the Rosebush. <laughs>